welcome to Intro Mechanical. I hope everyone enjoyed the lunch kahoot. Um, as the name of this presentation suggests, we're going to be going over the basics of mechanical, covering what we use to build robots, what we use to create robots, how we use what we use to create motion, and how we incorporate motion. So a little bit about me. This is my fourth year in FRC, and in that first picture, I was in grade eight, if that explains anything that's going on in there. Um, but pretty much I went from, in my first year, doing like zero mechanical other than game pieces, uh, to my second year having a little bit of build involvement, to in my third year suddenly being a designer on my team. Um, so in my like upbringing on the team, uh, there was a struggle to pass down knowledge, and this just came from uh, there not being enough time to organize for training meetings or lose, always running out of time. Um, so a lot of the stuff I knew um, in the 2018 season, I learned on my own before, the 20, before that season, um, pulling from many resources from teams. Um, and this was a long process, which is why in the summer I worked on creating FRC tutorials, um, which this workshop is a summary of. Uh, so I created this to ensure that my team members would always have access uh, to detailed resources to teach them everything they need to know about mechanical. Um, these resources can be used by any team, and they can be found on my team's website. Um, but yeah, for the sake of 40 minutes, I'm only going to be introducing and going over the general concepts of these things. But for more detail and for extra content, they can be found at this like hub of resources. Okay, so the elements of an FRC robot, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Just two words you need to remember, drivetrain, so that's the picture on the left, um, also called a chassis. That's the very base of a robot. And you can see in the second image on the right um, that it's just at the bottom right here. And everything that's built on top are mechanisms, and mechanisms are just um, things that we build to accomplish a certain task. So yeah, drivetrains and mechanisms. Okay, so what do we use to build robots? So we have three main vendors in FRC, and all of these are online stores. So there's VexPro, McMastercar, and Animark slash Studica. Um, and I'm just going to go over like some defining characteristics of them. VexPro uh, focuses on designing parts to allow for clean and powerful robot builds for everyone. So they sell a lot of commercial off-the-shelf parts, which are just like things that you can uh, easily assemble or just easily uh, put onto your robot. Um, and they're known for their motion items. Andymark and Studica. Andymark is a US company, and Studica is a Canadian distributor. Um, they sell the official uh, first season stuff, so like the game pieces you can buy from Andymark slash Studica. Um, but they also have a focus on creating kits and parts to help rookie teams. Um, so they're known for the drive kit that you'll get at the beginning of your season if you um, ask for that. Um, they all, they're also known for like their compliant wheels, which are like squishy wheels that you may have seen in 2018. Um, drive wheels, churro stock, etc. And McMaster Car is just a wide variety of hardware supplies for anything you could really want and anything that you can't find off of VexPro and Animark. Um, and they're known for their fasteners, uh, raw, material, ma raw materials, and pneumatic components. Um, and not on this list is BaneBots, um, but they also sell wheels that you can use for intakes. Uh, but yeah, those are the big three. So when we're building robots, we have to consider materials, and these are just the materials that we commonly use, aluminum, steel, lexan, slash polys, polycarbs, which are just plastics, um, and plywood. So when you're considering materials in general, you want a material that is strong, reliable, and not super heavy. So just the general characteristics. And you really want to consider weight, because weight, um, robots are constrained to a weight um, within a season. So like uh, 2018, the weight limit was like 120 pounds, I believe. Um, so that number really adds up, especially if, you're, if you have more than one mechanism. So you really got to be considering weight. So common materials that you'll see or like those materials make up these materials um, that you'll see in FRC. Um, the most common one is VersaFrame slash BoxTube, and this you can buy off of VexPro, um, one of the stores that we mentioned earlier. So VersaFrame is relatively light and very strong, so it gives us some check marks on that list um, we listed before. Um, and they use gussets, and there's a variety that VexPro sells. Um, you use gussets to fasten together two pieces of VersaFrame together. And you line them up with just the holes along the side of the VersaFrame. 
and you fasten them together with rivets. So this method of assembly is very quick and very clean because it helps you give you some kind of precision. Um, yeah, so that's a really, those two characteristics or several characteristics are very um, huge advantages. So it's a commonly used material. And I mentioned rivets. What are rivets? On the left is an image of what they look like. On the, on the right is how they work to fasten an item. Um, and this pulling up of the pin and breaking it is done with a rivet gun, which is um, either a manual tool or a pneumatic tool. Um, manual tool makes you really buff. Um, pneumatic tool makes you look cool, not as buff. So the other material that is commonly seen is a T-slot extrusion slash 8020. Uh, this is strong, once again, but um, heavier. And yeah, you'll notice that there's slots along the sides of it. And you can slide items through those slots if you mount it with the right pieces. So you'll notice in 2018, oh yeah? Oh, sure. Um, you'll notice in 2018 that several elevators are made out of this material. And that's because you can slide the items through those slots. However, though you can slide items through those slots, you can also fasten things into position um, using this, the method on the board. Uh, but if your material or if your fastener does come loose, it will like fall out of position. So that's something to consider. Um, yeah. C channel. Um, you'll see in kit of parts chassis, and it has holes along the side like VersaFrame. Um, you don't really see it used in structure because it's not very strong, and you might as well just use VersaFrame or box tube. Um, it does require a little bit more uh, materials, I guess. Uh, but yeah, you'll, you'll pretty much only see these in drivetrains. Churros, we don't build robots out of churros, um, but we do use them to add rigid rigidity to a system. So we connect them in between two plates uh, to position. So if I have two things here, like two plates here, and they tend to bend inwards, just put a churro in between them, and it'll keep them in place. And yeah, this is a very lightweight method. So um, Girls of Steel, who presented today, or will be presenting today, um, they did a workshop on plates and standoff use. So they use this method a lot of having a series of plates and standoffs to connect them because it's a very lightweight method. Um, and finally, if you'll notice on your robot, there are some pieces that don't really fall into those categories. And these are often just custom pieces. Um, and these pieces are designed in CAD, which is a digital design software and cut out by a CNC machine, which is a machine uh, operated by a computer. So they're very precise parts, and people want precise parts because they have specific place where they want to mount items um, or mount bearings. Um, yeah, so these are an essential, an es essential part to building a robot. But you don't want to build your entire robot out of that because um, it's time consuming and stuff like that. So. How do we create robots? And the list I'm about to share of machines, um, you probably won't see all of these in your shop, unless you have a big workshop and you do have all of these. Um, but yeah, just for a general knowledge of how teams manufacture their parts, it's, a, um, it's good to know what teams are using. So there's a vertical bandsaw, and you pass an item through the blade to slice it. The horizontal bandsaw and chop saw, um, you lower the blade, or the blade lowers into the item to slice it. Uh, drill press, you clamp an item, you clamp your piece to a work table and it's stationary and you lower a drill bit, a spinning drill bit into the piece to make holes. Um, why use this over a hand drill? Um, the drill press is more sturdy and stronger um, and just from your piece not moving, it's going to be more precise. Um, there's a C mill slash CNC mill and CNC, CNC means computer operated. Um, so you clamp your piece to a work table but this work table, you can move around a spinning drill bit. And you can move this work table on the x, y, and z axes um, around that drill bit. Um, so this can be either hand operated or operated by a computer. But even when you're operating it by, a hand, by hand, um, for simple cuts, you can still make them really precise because most grids, most mills, I believe, can create a grid around your piece. And you can just follow that grid to see how far away you've gone from a certain point. Um, and make your cuts like really, really precise. There's a lathe where you clamp typically like a round or semi-round item, like a hex shaft, piece of hex shaft, into the lathe. Um, and you sp it spins really fast, and you can make incisions or cuts into them 
by inserting a tool against it as it spins. So you can, yeah, uh, create incisions, cuts, or grind them down. This can be hand-operated or computer-operated, once again. Um, CNC router, this is commonly used for cutting uh, custom pieces out of soft materials just because it's really fast. Um, so similar concept to the mill, um, except rather than the piece moving around the drill bit, the drill bit's moving around the piece. Um, and once again, on like the X, Y, and Z axes. Um, for, so this cuts soft materials. For harder materials, um, you typically use like a CNC water jet or a CNC mill or a CNC laser cutter. And if your team doesn't have access to those, um, I recommend seeking a team that does have access to those and like asking if you can borrow their workshop or finding a metal cutting sponsor. Um, and a jigsaw is a hand tool for making cuts and you just guide the blade through the material and that's pretty much what you use when you don't have access to the other tools. So we used to use that a lot. Um, so what creates motion in robots? So whether an object, whether a robot is lifting an object, spinning a wheel, or performing some kind of action, they almost always use some form of actuator. And this is a motor or an air cylinder. So there's lots of different motors in FRC. To determine what motor we want to use for our application, we look at and compare several different things. So these are the four main motor characteristics. Um, so there's free speed the maximum speed at which a motor will rotate at when under no load, so when it's not mounted to anything. Free current is the minimum current a motor can draw when under no load. Stall torque is the amount of load placed on a motor that will cause it to stall or stop moving. And stall current is the amount of current drawn by a motor when it stalls. Um, I'll just pause there for a sec if people want to write that down. And yeah, load is just what the robot is spinning or what's hooked up to the motor, um, installed means can't move. Okay, and I mentioned torque. I'll go over that in the next slide, if people have, were wondering. Um, yeah. So what is torque? Torque is the ability to rotate an object. And if you were in the Versa Planetary Gearbox this morning, then you would have gotten a little bit familiar with this. Um, so yeah, it's the ability to rotate an object. So the larger or heavier your mechanism is mounted, like hooked on to this motor, the more torque you're going to need to spin it. Um, also the higher torque, the higher the torque is, the lower the speed. So it's an inverse relationship. And if it helps you imagine it better, um, the simplified force times distance. And force is the weight of the rotating mechanism in kilograms times the gravitational constant. Okay. So we know that motors output a certain amount of torque. Um, but to rotate a mechanism, you're going to need a lot more. And this is why we gear motors. Um, so additional torque is provided by the use of gear ratios in a gearbox. See figure. So um, yeah, to create more torque, you go from a small driving gear, which is like the first gear right here, a small driving gear to a larger um, driven gear. And that gives you a ratio of whatever the teeth are. So this is a 12 tooth gear against a 36 tooth gear. So that will give you a ratio of 12 to 36. And the bigger the ratio you have between these two will produce a larger amount of torque. And once again, torque is like the strength of your motor, your motor's ability to turn whatever load. Okay, so common motors in FRC, I'm also just going to go over the defining characteristics of them. So a sim has a very high stall torque. And stall torque, once again, is like um, how high, what kind, like the maximum load it can handle before it stops moving. So the sim has a very high stall torque. The mini sim has a high stall torque, not quite as high as the sim. Um, also, sims, um, in most seasons, there will be a limit on the number of sims you can use. So typically, it's a limit of six sims. For 2018, there was no limit, but um, it's typically a rule, and it says in the game manual for each season, so I would double check that. Um, there is a bag motor and 775 Pro. So these are like the speedy ones. These ones are the stronger ones. So out of the speedy ones, Bag motor, 
has a high free speed, but 775 Pro has a very high free speed. Um, the bag motor outputs more torque than the 775 Pro at the same current level, but the 775 Pro has a higher stall torque, so it can like, deal with a higher load that's applied onto it. Um, another defining characteristic of these motors is that bags, mini sims, and sims, they don't burn out as easily as 775 Pros, and that's because um, once they hit their stall torque, or that's because the motors are better at cooling themselves down, um, but pretty much when they hit, when each of these motors hit the stall torque, I learned this from your presentation of you. When each of the motors hit their stall torque, um, the bags and like many sims last around like two minutes for each of them. Maybe it's just a sim. Okay, yeah. So those, the bag, mini sim, and sim can hold out longer than the 775 Pro once it hits its um, stall torque. Then it's going to start burning out really quickly. And burning out is just when it's drawing too much power from the electronics board. Um, so it starts to overheat, and in some cases we'll start smoking. Um, in most cases, we'll just smell bad, like smell like burning rubber. It smells like burning. So, how do we incorporate motion? Where am I? How do we incorporate motion? And these are just motion basics, very basics. Um, so, for anything we want to rotate, we mount onto a hex-shaped shaft. Compared to a round shaft and a round bore, the, rec the hex shape will help make sure the item turns with the shaft versus a round shaft spinning inside of the item and the item not moving with it. So if you're wondering why we use that hex shape. Um, and with a hex shaped shaft, your part requires a hex shape bore slash inner diameter. Um, and this is common with a lot of FRC parts, so very lucky. Um, and now that we have the shaft and we have the things that we want to rotate on it, uh, we need to secure that shaft into a position on our robot. So how do we do that while still allowing it to move? And the answer is bearings. Um, so you put the shaft through the bearings, and it can spin within those bearings, and you mount those bearings into your material. So the inside of the bearing in the gift that you can see can spin with the shaft, but the outside of the bearing does not move, um, so it's not going to grind down the hole that you place it um, into in your material. So wherever you have shafts, you're going to have bearings in your robot. Uh, gearboxes. So we know that motors um, output a certain amount of torque, and we know that with our mechanisms, we typically need to increase that amount of torque that the motor produces. So we do that using gearboxes, um, and just to encase that whole system of having our gears and reductions and stuff. So these are drivetrain gearboxes, uh, single speed and yeah, single speed, and we'll go into double speed later. But these are single speed drivetrain gearboxes. Um, and VexPro is a good supplier for gearboxes, especially if you're Canadian, because um, Andy, Mark, and Sudica are more expensive with the shipping and stuff. Um, and as I mentioned before, VexPro is known for their motion items. So gearboxes typically in a drivetrain typically have two or three SIMs on it. Having a three SIM gearbox will make your robot faster and stronger with the extra power. Um, but it can be a waste of sims if there's a restriction that year, um, or it could be a waste of weights because they are pretty heavy. And sims are the motors that I mentioned before that have the really high stall, stall torque. Um, yeah, so in drivetrains, you have single speed gearboxes. There's also dual speed gearboxes, which are commonly used. Um, so single speed gearboxes have one overall ratio that your robot uses. Dual speed has two two gear, sets of gear ratios that your robot can shift between. Um, yeah, so your robot can shift between these two different ratios to create different effects. So in dual speed gearboxes, there's a low gear, which produces a higher amount of torque, but it has a smaller maximum speed, and a high gear, which has less torque and a higher maximum speed. So low gear, low speed, high gear, high speed. Um, yeah, so once again, you can buy these from VaxPro. There's also versions on Animark, but VexPro is pretty good. Um, yeah, so how these work. Um, there's a shifter in the gearbox that can shift to engage one set of gears, um, or you can shift to engage the other set of gears. And typically when you're using this, or the advantage of using this um, compared to 
with single speed gearbox is that you can reach much higher speeds while driving with these gearboxes. So pretty much you start in the low gear, high torque, smaller maximum speed. You start in the low gear, which accelerates you quickly towards the maximum speed. And while it's accelerating, you shift into the higher gear to increase your maximum speed. Um, if you just start in, in high gear though, if you started moving while in the high gear though, um, your gearboxes would brown out because it requires too much current to start driving in that gear. So that's why single speed gearboxes are at a, at a disadvantage because they can't reach that maximum speed if they're wanting to start driving in that gear ratio. Okay. So for almost all mechanisms, you compare your motors with a Versa Planetary. And these, compared to these gearboxes before, are a lot more compact while still giving you like very low to high ratios. And, but that compactness um, is very ideal because you don't want these massive honking gearboxes everywhere you have a motor. Um, so when you have a mechanism, you typically move towards a Versa Planetary gearbox. Um, yeah. So yeah. And just to explain uh, the general concept of gearing, we can see in this gearbox, this is a stage, this is one stage. And you can fill it with either of these ratios, so 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, 7 to 1, 8 to 1, 10 to 1. Um, and you can fill it, this one stage with either one of these ratios. When you move to two stages, you can fill another one with another ratio. So let's say this one is 3 to 1. This one is 4 to 1. So that will give you an overall ratio of 12, 12 to 1. 3 times 4, not 7 to 1, 3 plus 4. You're multiplying fractions. Okay. And power transmission. Power transmission is a transfer of energy from where it's generated, the motor, to the place of work, the mechanism. So there's two methods of power transmission, either sprockets and chain, and pulleys and belts at low load applications. So when your mechanism's not super like heavy and large, um, you can use either or. And the differences are just some key char characteristics I'll point out. But as you move to higher loads, you want to use sprockets and chain. And when you get to like a super high load, you either increase the number, like the strength of the train, chain, or you move to just like two gears spinning each other. But yeah, pretty much at low loads, you can use either or. At higher loads, use sprocket and chain. So the key characteristics between the two, one of them is that, um, and like the reason why people often choose belts and pulleys over sprockets and chain, uh, belt and pulleys are a lot lighter, as you can ima imagine. Um, another key characteristic is that belts, this isn't necessarily an advantage, but belts are one continuous loop, as you can see in this picture. Um, whereas chain, you can break and reconnect. So if your belt snaps during a match or whatever, or after a match, it's more difficult to replace than you um, could with chain. Because if your belt snaps, then you have to loop the belt around it, but you can't really like loop it around. You have to like stick the pulleys back into the belt and put it onto your system. So it's a pain, um, but they shouldn't snap if you tension them properly which requires some precise manufacturing, and not all teams necessarily have access to that. Um, yeah, whereas sprocket, with chain, sprocket and chain, you can just disconnect and reconnect. Um, what might be surprising is that, hi, is that sprocket and chain, um, I forgot my train of thought, yeah. A uh, difference that might be surprising to you is that sprocket and chain lengthens over time, uh, whereas pulleys and bellies don't tend to if they're tensioned properly. Um, but yeah, sprocket and chain does lengthen over time and stretch over time. And you'll notice it because it'll start to sag. Um, yeah, it'll start to sag. So you can either, one method of retensioning it, and tensioning, being able to retension it is a key thing when you're using sprocket and chain. Um, a method to retension it once it starts to sag is to pull the sprockets further apart so that the chain becomes tight again. But that's not always possible. This is a method commonly used in drivetrains. But in your mechanisms, you might not be able to incorporate that into your design. So one method is this. Um, and pretty much you're creating a cam against your chain. So if I had a piece of rod, and this is like the rod on the mechanism, like right here, you create 
create the mounting hole, or you make the mounting hole off-centered, so like somewhere right around here, and then as you spin it, it will give you a different diameter. So if I spin it this way, it's going to give me a growing diameter against like something that's against here. And then you can spin it and then mount it in this position with this diameter, and then when the chain becomes loose again, make it even tighter, and so on. So yeah, that's some methods of how to tension chain. And also in FRC, there's two types of chain that you will see being used. There's number 25 and number 35. Um, use 20, number 25 as much as possible, um, just because number 35 is heavier. Um, so use 25 as much as you can, and then when 25 becomes too weak, then you move up to 35, and 35 sprockets. Okay, and finally, um, air cylinders. That's the other form of actuator that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, so you can think of this as, it's a similar concept to a syringe. Um, I also use the example that it's like a, a piston in Minecraft. Um, I used that with a group of kids and none of them understood it. So they're missing out because they don't get to understand. Um, yeah, so there's two positions of an air cylinder, either retracted or extended. Whereas with a motor, you have like a variety of different positions you can hit. So when you're designing a mechanism, and you know it's only going to reach two positions, um, such as like, you'll see in this video, there's a gear intake, and it's either in this position within the robot, or this posi position where it's sticking out of the robot. So when you know your robot's only going to use two positions, you typically want to actuate it with an air cylinder. And from this GIF, you might think that like, I can only actuate things um, retracted, extended on the horizontal axis, or retracted, extended on the vertical axis. Um, but I'll show you an example of how it can be used differently and how it's typically used in like mechanisms in FRC and in real life. So you'll notice, look at this piston. This one is retracted. And then as it extends, it's extending this way. So it's creating kind of an angular motion. So I'll play that one more time. So retracted, extended. And you can play around with that um, ability to rotate things or move things with air cylinders like that by having one point mounted on the robot at whatever level or whatnot, and the other point mounted to your mechanism. Yeah. So... That pretty much... Oh, yeah, and this stuff you can buy off of McMaster car often. Oh, and, yeah, <laughs> there's different sizes of the bore, which is like the body, so different sizes of this, uh, which gives you different like strength, and different lengths of the stroke, which is like the rod that extends out, so you can play around with those dimensions as well. And yeah, that pretty much concludes this presentation. Um, all of the stuff that I mentioned will is on and will be summarized in, in more detail on FRC tutorials, which once again can be found on my team's website. Um, and yeah. Thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, you can talk to me after the presentation is done or whenever, or you could also just email me at my email there or email 771. Yeah. Um, are these going to be available online? Yeah, so uh, this presentation is like the summary of it, but you'll see like each of the topics that I hit um, in three different presentations um, at that link before, or down here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How does your team machine your parts? How does our team machine our parts? So, um, just for some background knowledge, SWAT, like all of our stuff, is contained within like one closet of a room, which is not very convenient, and it doesn't give us like a big workshop space for machines. So pretty much we have access to, if I go back in slides, we have access to a vertical bandsaw. That's pretty much the one that we have. 
Um, we have access to a chop saw sometimes, <laughs> um, a drill press, and that's it. Oh, and we also have the jigsaw, of course. Um, so yeah, we only have access to the basic, basic machines. So we do have a metal cutting sponsor, which I mentioned um, during this part of the presentation. Um, but yeah, we do have a metal cutting sponsor, so they water cut, water jet cut our custom pieces and then deliver it to us. Um, but for parts that we need to mill, um, make like cuts that you would do on a mill, like such as a slot or, yeah, <laughs> such as a slot or whatever, um, it takes a longer time for our sponsor to do that because then they actually have to like physically do it um, unless they have access to a CNC mill. But for milling and stuff, we go to team 1334 and 1374, uh, which is a team local to us, like pretty close to us. Um, and they have access to these tools and they are willing to uh, share some of their tools with us. So on days where we're not meeting in build season, uh, we'll often go to their school and machine parts at their space, which is really nice of them. Uh, but yeah, so I recommend if you're a team like us where you don't have access to a lot of these machines, find a metal cutting sponsor and find a team local to you that you can drop into the workshop. Oh, yeah? Oh, sure. That too, I made accidentally. I made like two pages of it um, and I only published one of them. I could go back and fix it, but <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Thank you.